Hello and welcome to this Arts Afternoon. My name is Jacob Harrison. I'm a curate here at Christchurch Chorley Wood. And I'm Laura Joyner and I'm a pastoral assistant here at Christchurch Chorley Wood. Well, it is our great pleasure to be able to share this afternoon with you. Uh, in what follows, we're going to be looking at the different creative ways members of our church family uh, have been occupying themselves over the last few weeks. So there's going to be a series of short videos and then about part way through, we're going we're to pause and just reflect a little bit on the Christian hope. So if you're ready, tea and cakes will invite you to sit back, relax with your cup of tea in a comfortable chair and watch with us the Arts Afternoon from Christchurch, Chorley Wood. Hi, I'm going to make for us a raspberry roulade. Um, it's really easy to make. So the ingredients you need are four egg whites, first of all. So I've already put them in this bowl. Put them in there, make sure it all goes in. And then put it on a high whisk for as long as it takes so they become really stiff. Once the egg whites are all whisked, it will come out and it will be like this, literally that stiff that you can turn it over. You then have to add 250 grams of caster sugar. If you just add a tablespoon at a time while you're whisking, I'll turn it on now and then literally just like that, whisk it until all the sugar has been incorporated with the egg whites and becomes really glossy. But do do it on a high whisk. Okay, if you've got a hand whisk, use it on the highest um, setting you've got. Once all the sugar and the egg has been whisked, it will come out, it'll be really thick and glossy. So take it out of the bowl and then pour it onto the, well, with spoonfuls, put it onto the baking tray and just flatten it down into like a rectangle shape. So it looks like this, either line the baking tray with parchment or baking paper, okay? Then put it in the oven for 10 minutes on 200 degrees and sort of halfway down the oven. So put it in, leave that for 10 minutes at 200 and after 10 minutes, turn it down to 160 for eight minutes. Once you've done that, you take it out of the oven, I'll show you, you can see it's risen. It's quite crispy around the edges, which is nice. So the next thing you do you have to turn it over. So you have another piece of parchment paper, roughly the same size, laid on your work surface. Get hold of the meringue, hold on to the parchment paper bit, and obviously with a tea towel. 
So you're just holding the parchment paper as well. So when you turn them around out, you've still got hold of the parchment paper. So you just get hold of it very carefully, just put it on the edge, like this, and flip it. Just gradually push it down, and then with the tea towel, be careful because it'll be really hot. Take the baking tray off, and then remove the top piece of parchment paper. And there you have your meringue, which now you have to leave until it's cool before you can add your cream or whatever you want to put inside it, otherwise it will just melt. So leave it on the side for about 20 minutes and then we can add the cream. So whisk 300ml of cream um, until it gets to a nice sort of whipping consistency. Put it onto the pavlova, cover it, just leave the edges a little bit sort of clear. And then after you've done that, you can add any filling you like. I normally add raspberries, which look really nice. Just place the raspberries on. I don't wash the raspberries. If you wash them, they become all wet. Uh, it doesn't matter how much you try and dry them, it will make the meringue go really soggy. So my advice is buy fresh raspberries. Um, these ones I brought in the co-op today in Chorleywood. And you can see they're lovely. They all look very clean and fresh. And then just place them on as many as you want. I normally just do a row, as you can see, like this. Everybody wants to have a few strawberries with their pavlova. Sometimes it's really nice also to add um, fresh mango puree on it. That's really nice. Then once you've done that, the bit that everybody worries about, but it's really easy, so don't panic. Get your tray ready. And then you just roll it. It doesn't matter, it will crack, but that's all part of it once it's done. So just hold the parchment paper or grease to paper and just literally turn it over so like a sausage so hence it looks like that as you can see it's all cracked but that all adds to it and then get your dish I normally put it in the fridge for about half an hour just to let it set um, place it on leave it wrapped like that and then just put it in the fridge for, like I say, around about half an hour. Hi, the best bit now of the pavlova is eating it. Here is my cameraman, Jake, who's been <laughs> helping me. So I said he could sit and have some with us. Anyway, I just thought I'd quickly show you. There's the pavlova. I've just sprinkled icing sugar over it just to make it look a bit prettier. So the end piece, which is Jake's favourite, I'm going to give it to him. go there you go Jake thanks and then if I cut a piece I can show you what the inside looks like it's really nice and light anyway I'll have a coffee now to have with it there we go thanks cheers Jake cheers mum enjoy god you bless too. everybody yeah. Hi, my name's Richard Killick. I've been asked to tell you about some verses that a group of friends produced while we were isolating. They tell their own story. Go back to March. From lockdown, walking's a delight. So too is birdsong in the plain free sky. I spot a fearless robin first. A cheery sight, more tuneful than the red kite cruising by. The lark at heaven's gate sings and sings, a kestrel hovers static on wimpling wings. But best for me the blackbird lusting for a mate, trilling his songbook, bright-eyed, yellow-billed, just great. And to remind you of April... We're getting waitress in the morning, ding dong, the bells are going to chime. Pull out the stopper, let's have a whopper, deliver me a slot on time. And on a more serious note, in May, I'll tell you a tale that's been re recently written of a powerful army so great it saved Britain. They didn't have bombs and they didn't have planes. 
They fought with their hearts and they fought with their brains. We clapped on our streets, hearts bursting with pride as they went to war while we stayed inside. They struggled at first as they searched for supplies, but they stared down the virus in the white of its eyes. They leapt from the trenches and didn't think twice. Some never came back, paid the ultimate price. So tired and so weary, yet still they fought on as the virus was beaten and the battle was won. The many of us owe so much to so few, the brave and the bold, our heroes in blue. So let's line the streets and remember our debt. We love you, our heroes, lest we forget. And finally, it's something a, a, a bit more light-hearted. I must go down to the pharmacy again in the ghost town that's nearby. All I ask are a mask and gloves and some goggles for my eyes. I must go down to the bank again, for the bills must still be paid. But I wore my mask and gloves there, and the cashier shouted, Raid! The shutters dropped, the sirens screamed, security guards came running. Next time, forget the mask, I thought. I should really be more cunning. Well, that's a selection of the poems that we wrote. I hope you like, like my choices, and thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Coralie. I'm going to tell you about one of my hobbies, patchwork and quilting. A passion for this blossomed during the 1990s and has continued to this very day. And I would say my greatest influence was my mum who taught me all of my skills. I'm going to demonstrate how to make a half square triangle block. Firstly, take two pieces of fabric, two squares. They can be of any size. Put right sides together and draw a line with a pencil or a pen across the diagonal. Place two pins, as I'm doing here. And then on the sewing machine, or by hand, you sew either side of the drawn line, the pencil or pen line, a quarter of an inch. Remove the pins and either with this tool or a pair of scissors cut along the line that you drew with either a pen or a pencil. Open up your block and you will have two half square triangle blocks. Here I have put the blocks together. You'll be able to see the half square triangles and you can put them in any order or um, design that you like. This particular piece is going to go on the back of a rainbow quilt for my grandson who is three years old, but it's on the back. Here is the rainbow quilt that I'm making for my grandson who's three years old. He asked me to make a rainbow quilt. Um, I've been making it in the last two weeks. The top is completed now and I'm just working on the, the back of the quilt which I just showed you with the half square triangles. It has been a joy to make in all these beautiful bright colours. This is a Japanese puzzle quilt. It's part of my more recent collection. Again, using my favourite colour of blue. And now using all Japanese fabrics. 
Japanese hand quilting technique is called sashiko. This technique works particularly well when using white sashiko thread in contrast to the dark blue. This is one of my favourite quilts. It hangs in my living room. It includes many of my favourite blues and creams. The design is called Square Dance. What I love about it is the sense of movement where your eye is taken around the whole composition using colour as your guide. This is my house quilt. I started it in January. It is machine pieced and hand quilted. The hand quilting I um, completed during the beginning of lockdown. There was a lot of work actually in the um, hand quilting that goes all the way around the edge and across the sashings. It was due to be entered into a quilt show this year, however that obviously has to, had to be postponed and it will be in the quilt show hopefully next year. Again it's using the blues that I so much enjoy and I so often come back to blues. Um, I have really enjoyed sharing my passion of patch patchwork with you. I hope this inspires you to be creative too. Thank you. Well, that was some really great talent so far. Laura, 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 what are you doing? Well, I've just had a notification. I'm getting waitrose in the morning. <laughs> Richard inspired me. <laughs> <laughs> well, coming up now, we have a magic trick. My name is Gregory and I, I am doing a magic trick. Just do it. <laughs> Hard, go, quickly. Yay! <laughs> Hello, my name's Helen, and I'm going to show you how you can make sugar paste roses for cake decorations. These are some sugar paste roses that I made a bit earlier, and I'm going to show you how to make them out of our regular ready roll icing. So you can buy this in any supermarket in packets and to turn this into modelling paste you need to mix it with Tylo powder, that's T-Y-L-O powder and you can buy this from any cake decorating website. I think this pot cost me about three pounds but it does last a long time. So for about 250 grams of icing you need to mix one teaspoon of Tylo powder and you need to really work it in together and I'd recommend that you knead it for a good five minutes to make sure that the powder is mixed to all of the icing and you can see it becomes quite stretchy and pliable and it's much easier to work with. Then you need two pieces of this crisp paper. And the first thing you need to do is to pinch off small amounts and roll them into little balls. Now each one of these is going to be one of your rose petals. And depending on how large little balls of icing you use it will depend on the size of your rose. So you roll those down like that and you take your grease of paper and you put it into the ball, squash it down, pop it between the grease of paper and then with your index finger just quite firmly press it down, particularly around the edges. Those are the bits you want to be the thinnest because that's what we're going to fold over to give us the shape of the petals. And you do that until it's quite thin and gently peel back the grease of paper. And I've got a little butter knife here and I'm just going to use that to lift that off the bottom piece and place it with my other ones. You need about four or five to make 
each rose. Then I'm going to get one of those and I'm, to make the centre of the rose I'm just going to roll that over quite tightly to start off the centre bit. And I've got my bud there. And I'm going to take another of my circles and just roll that around the outside not too tightly and just pinch it at the bottom so that it sticks and then you can gently either with your finger or I find sometimes with a knife just bend that outwards and you can see how you're starting to get the shape of the rose then you take your next circle and where you've got the fold you tend to put it's best to put the middle of the, your next petal and again roll it round pinch it at the bottom and then gently fold it back to give you the shape of your flower and you just keep doing this to make your rose as full as you want it to be. You can use four or five. Pinch around the bottom and then just gently. This is where you really do need the modeling paste, sugar paste, normal ready roll icing can often split. And you just carry on for as many petals as you want until you've got the rose the size. There's another one there. Now this icing will go rock hard when it's dried in the air. So you can get a cocktail stick and just sit it. Get a cocktail stick and sit it down until it's completely dry and then if you wanted you could perhaps decorate the edges now these, this is a picture of some other roses that I made for a cake I decorated a while ago and some made out of pink icing, some silver and white and some then little icing green leaves and then another cake that I did had some silver and white roses and if you have a look here you'll see that we've got a few buds in with the silver leaves as well. Well, I wish I could have put roses on this cake. They were beautiful. Um, so, without further ado, we're going to move on to our next video clip. A very talented lady called Clara, who writes her own worship music. This song is called You Light Me Up. I hope you like. <laughs>
Hi, my name is Sylvia Headley uh, and I, my passion is in restoring furniture and painting furniture. I always been a very creative person and I enjoy restoring old furniture, giving it new lease of life. Um, this is a project I'm working on now. It's a balloon style chair. You can see it before and after. Um, the process with this is I would always start with checking the condition of the chair. If it's in a good working order, if it's safe, if it needs any repairs. Once that done, I would start stripping off the fabric and checking the padding of the seat just to make sure that it's nicely padded and safe. And after that, I would be moving on into sanding the whole chair, checking the wood and cleaning it thoroughly before I start painting. I use mainly Farrow and Wolf paints as they are very high in pigmentation and very high in resin, which usually gives the finished product a really lovely, luxurious feel. Um, and because of the high pigmentation of the color, it gives a really lovely finish. After the paint, I will be doing first um, I will be using probably two coats of the base coat and two or three coats of the top coat and once that's thoroughly dried I'll be then moving on to uh, the wax which preserves and hardens the furniture so it protects it from any knockings or anything like that. Um, I hope you like this video um, and please enjoy the slideshow after of my work. Um, and uh, thank you for watching. Well, I think you'd agree we've seen some wonderful things already so far this afternoon. But I do think it's come to that time where we need to just pause perhaps and reflect on all that wonderful creativity. And so, Jacob, I've got a few questions for you. Would you mind answering them? Go for it. <laughs> Great. So I've noticed that you haven't actually contributed anything <laughs> to this afternoon, apart from being here with me, of course. <clears throat> but can I ask you, in what ways are you creative? That's a very good question. I mean, I'm not particularly artistic. I'm not particularly musical either. But I think creativity comes into so much of, of life. I think um, people who work in, in even in office jobs and problem solve day to day. Yes, I agree. Seeking to, to set things right on a national or local level. I think there's a degree of creativity there that's required. For myself, I think the, the thing I really enjoy is home renovation or DIY. Oh, really? I really enjoyed a couple of years as a student working my yes. summer holidays yeah. um, on a, a building site, really. Did you? Doing those finishing touches to, 
to, to housing and yeah so that would be my favorite sort of creativity yes um, so Jacob that's amazing I would never have thought that that would be something that you'd be so keen on in your creative self so how do you actually make that connection between that creativity and your faith yeah well, I think whenever I see uh, creativity in the world, someone else's or, or perhaps e even my own at times, uh, I see something of, of our creative God, that uh, the one who flung stars into yeah. space is, is the yeah. same one that gave us our creativity. You know, being made in the image of God means I'd expect us to be creative people. Yes, I agree. Uh, there's a verse at the start of Psalm 19 and it says this, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And I find myself sometimes looking out uh, at night or on at sunsets or sunrises yes. and just thinking how awesome and creative God is. And I look at the world and see how beautiful things are, how uh, amazingly put together yeah. everything is. And yes. so uh, the link between sort of human creativity and my Christian faith kind of uh, links me back to, to yes. the God I know and love. And, I kind of expect us to be creative because he's creative. <laughs> I completely understand what you're saying and I think you're absolutely right. You know, the, the wonders that we see around us in the world, through nature, through the colours, through the diversity, and God has given these to us as such a gift. But you and I both know that there are lots of not so great things in the world and lots of horribleness. And, you know, obviously we're celebrating what we've been doing during lockdown this afternoon. And obviously that for many people has caused a lot of pain. Mm. How would you sort of take that forward into that type of situation? Yeah, I suppose how I approach that is very different because I'm a Christian. So. Yeah. I think there are things in the world that, just as there are things that are beautiful, there are things that are ugly. Yes. And we all know that. We all know that the world is, is broken in some way, that yeah. we ourselves are, are not what we could be or, or almost should be. Yes. And what is awesome about the Christian hope is that that God who flung stars into space stepped down into to time and history. Yes. It's not that he's disinterested but he is totally interested. It's not Absolutely. that he's distant, but he wants to be totally involved. It's not that he is unloving, but he is so loving. He sent his son. Uh, and the pro promises of, of the Bible are that, that this world will one day be restored. Yes. The Bible's very honest about the mess we're in, but the promises are awesome. God will restore the earth. Uh, but better still for you and I, and we know there's things in, in our life for each one of us where we think they're not quite as we'd like them to be yeah. or how they yeah. should be. There's yeah. a brokenness there, yes. sometimes a, an ugliness. Yes. Well, the promises of the cross and of, of Jesus Christ's redeeming work means that not only is there a creator God who flung stars into space, but there's a recreating God who, who comes into to our lives and makes us new. Hallelujah. <laughs> There's a wonderful story. It's probably apocryphal, yeah. but it's one of those things that you hope is true. It's of Michelangelo and he, uh, the artist and, yes. and, and sculptor, and it's said of him that he, he once was asked about uh, carving statues. Yes. And he said this, he said, when I look at a block of marble, I see the angel and I just start carving until I set him free. Oh. That's beautiful. Isn't it? Isn't it? And you know yes. what, there's, there's a lot to be said about as a, as a person choosing to walk with the Lord Jesus, when you mm. commit to following him, he, he sets to work by his spirit, yes. redeeming and recreating us. A bit like that angel set free, so too we can know freedom because of the gospel, because of the cross. And that is a Christian hope. And that's exciting, isn't it, Jacob? It is, Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Well, thank you so much for answering those questions. Um, fascinating. And it's really good to find out a little bit more about you too. So why don't we finish our cake? Sounds good to me. And watch the next few videos together. Hello, everyone. My name's Melanie Hamilton and I live in Northwood. I've been going to Christchurch for a very long time. I'm married to Robert Finney and 
here I am in my garden. I'm just going to show you a few of the things I've been doing in the lockdown. I've been taking cuttings. I've never really done that before, but it was something to do to get extra plants. I've taken some uh, cuttings from my Penn stamens here, which is a, something that comes up every year. That's known as a perennial, I think but you can make extra plants by chopping a bit off them and taking a cutting really easily. So cut off a bit of the plant, chop just below where the two leaves sprout out on the stem. You might even have to cut. And then remove all the leaves very carefully so you don't damage the stem. And chop off about three quarters of the leaves at least towards the top so you're left with something that looks a bit like a shuttlecock feather thing and then just simply put it into some damp compost around the edge of a pot this is a penstamen and then within about the next month you will have some brand new plants and you can plant them all around your garden again to spread them around keep them in the shade in a, in a shady spot where they don't get dried out by the sun Something else I was really glad I'd done last summer was at the end of every year, I collect seed from my garden so that I don't have to pay for new seeds the next year. I'll just show you how to do that. So write on an envelope what you're collecting. This is Cosmos Dark Pink. And then venture out onto your borders and find um, a dark pink seed pod. This one here, actually just check snip off the seed heads they should really probably be a bit drier than I'm showing you but then just put them into your envelope and um, use them uh, next year I'm also really hoping to take seed from something I've grown new this year which is some of these larkspur here which resemble little tiny almost delphinium type flowers once that's then, I'm going to cut it down to the ground, take the seed heads off, and then hopefully I'm going to have new seeds again next year. These adjuratums here I grew from seed heads that I collected in an envelope, so that was lovely to get those. But always label your envelopes, otherwise you get very mixed up. I've been growing a, some sunflowers in a sunflower competition that Kathleen Waller kindly provided everybody with, with some seeds and I've got the baby, the mum and the dad sunflower growing there. Finally, I just wanted to share with you a tip Ms Pendred gave me from Christchurch School. When your sweet peas are looking a bit past it, and mine are soon, keep feeding them. But when they get really past it, just cut them right down at the bottom. Take all this off the, the canes and then they sprout up again and we'll give you a second um, decent crop. They'll grow again from the base, which is quite handy to know because they're so lovely to keep cutting all the time, keep cutting them so they, they come. And the last thing I've been up to in the lockdown was in the spring, I planted up a lot of um, little plants from my garden underneath perennials that they'd sprouted out, got new plants, this is some dahlias, and I had a sale for Alzheimer's Sadly, my dad is suffering from that. Um, and it raised quite a bit of money. And thank you to everybody who um, came and, and bought my plants. Anyway, happy gardening. Hello, I'm Lynn. And here are some of the things I made before lockdown. These are made out of silver. Things like necklaces, rings, pendants earrings, all made out of lovely tactile silver, impossible to get hold of during lockdown. So I had to make it with what I had in my shed. And this is what I have. A couple of old pipes, some copper tube, some wire and some washers I picked up at the engineering exhibition last year. So here's some washers I got at the model engineering exhibition last year. 
and I'm going to make some earrings out of these. But I'd like to change the shape of this big one, change it from a circle into an oval. And I'm going to use the rolling mill here. And it has the same effect as, do you remember when some naughty kids years back used to put pennies on the railway line to change the shape? Well, this has the same effect. Let's see what happens. Here we go. Here it is. It's changed its shape. That's what it was like before it went through the rolling mill. So now I'm going to solder a few of these washers together to make an interesting shape. So here are the finished earrings with the addition of a few more washers having been pickled, hammered, polished, filed, sanded down and uh, a couple of beads have been added and some ear wires. And here are some of the other things I made during lockdown. A couple of pendants there. Uh, can you see um, what was supposed to be a cat? So this is the pipe somebody gave me a couple of weeks ago and I'm going to make a bangle with this. I'm just sawing a bit off first of the right length. And a quick tap to make sure that no spiders are left inside, because I like spiders. <laughs> Fine. So, to turn this pipe into a bangle, I'm using this big hammer to put dents here and there into the pipe. And as I go along, I'll turn to these smaller hammers here to produce a design on the pipe. So here is the finished bangle after thousands of hammer blows, lots of polishing and the addition of leather on the inside. So proper jewellers plan things out well beforehand but I just make things up as I go along. <laughs> Hello this is Patrick Turnbull. Um, we've been going to Christchurch for about 20 years now um, with my wife Susie. Um, we have three children, Ellie, Henry and Annabelle. Well, they're not kids anymore, actually, they're young adults. So this is two or three minutes from me on what we've been doing. Apart from working um, in lockdown, I spend hours trying to start my little half a cc engine. I just cannot get it going. I built this little plane, which is a control line plane. So you control the aileron by string. I'm hoping to fly this, which has got a much bigger engine and will go much faster. It's also a control line plane. Then here is Sprout. Say hello, everybody. No. Cooking with crumpet and Sprout. Show you what I'm going to do with this massive four rib of beef. I'll show you um, what to do. Yep, no doubt. <laughs> Off you go. <laughs> it's not dry aged, so we'll see what it's actually like. Cut the end off, <clears throat> the end rib off this four rib of beef. And I'm going to make uh, tonight Kurt Dubois. What I've got is a smoking hot pan uh, with some oil. It's really very, very, it's very hot. And I'm just going to chuck the Kurt Dubois in that I've seasoned and dried. And it should absolutely smoke away. And the idea now is to caramelize it on both sides. And while this is happening, I'm going to bake the other side. So one final shot of the basting and this is finished take the garlic out of here let it cool down finish peeling it and bung it in with the mini roast potatoes Kurt de Boeuf, um cooked at home it's so quick and so easy the main challenge is how do you get this coin from the top 
of this glass through into the bottom of that one without spilling the water. The secret of this trick is, and this does have disaster written all over it, gently tap the glass and move it so there's a tiny bit of an edge. This is all about surface tension of the water. It's very clever. And you put the coin there, it's gonna fall off, but you'd have to do it two or three times. It's about to go, and there it is. It's gone, it's in, close it, and it's done. And only a couple of drops came out. Grab this and pull it. And according to Mr. Finney, this should work a treat, but a bit worried about banging my hand on the glass there. So something else very exciting that's been happening in lockdown mm -hmm. is our youngest daughter Annabelle um, has managed to persuade Mabel to uh, sit on some eggs. How many eggs are there? Thirteen. Thirteen and very excitingly one of them hatched this afternoon but we're not allowed in there. She won't let us get in there um, but hopefully in the next day or two. Oh do you see that? She's really defending her little chick and we don't want to do anything to upset her. And you can see all those other eggs. hilarious. I wish I'd put a tablecloth underneath this Jacob and given that a go myself. <laughs> I don't know about that, that china looks rather nice. <laughs> and then on that note I think I might have another cup of tea actually. <laughs> well our next contributor could give Jamie Oliver a run for his money. Ooh. Over to you Alistair. Hello Christchurch, my name is Alistair Bassett and I am the children's ministry trainee here. Um, during lockdown, one of the things that I have been doing, like many others, is getting up to some baking. At the beginning of lockdown, my girlfriend bought me this cookbook. It's the cookbook of one of my favourite food podcasts. And they've got a great recipe for something that everybody seems to be cooking. Banana bread. And so, as part of the arts afternoon, I thought I would welcome you into the schoolhouse kitchen. Let's get started. I have washed my hands, of course, for 20 seconds. I've got my apron on to, to protect myself. I have preheated my oven to 180 degrees, because it's a fan oven, and I have pre-lined my loaf tin. So, let's get cracking. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to sieve the flour, and that was 280 grams of plain flour. I'm now going to add a teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda. Some recipes require it, some don't. And I also need a pinch of salt. The next part is to use a separate bowl, so I'm just gonna move this one over and I'm gonna take my butter, which is 110 grams of unsalted butter, and the sugar, which is 220 grams of caster sugar. Got a one spoon and a whisk. Um, unfortunately, I do not have a electric whisk. Otherwise, that would make my life a whole lot easier. I now have a pale and fluffy butter and sugar mixture as the recipe requires. And again, I'm just gonna move this to the side. And the next thing you need, obviously baking banana bread, are some bananas. They're not very ripe, they are, but they're, but they're, but they're still about a week old. So they'll, they'll definitely do for this banana bread. Um, some people make banana bread because they've got leftover bananas. I buy them especially because I do enjoy banana bread. So now I've got bana my bananas, I'm just gonna grab a potato masher and mash them up. One tip when you come to mashing your potatoes is that if you have some chunks of banana, that is all right, because if there are some chunks in the mixture, then it means you've got a nice banana flavoring the butter and sugar and then give it a good mix, which is just what I'm gonna do now. So now I have my banana mix. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to add um, 
80 millilitres of milk. Okay. I'm going to add two eggs. In they go. Try and prevent any shell going in. And a teaspoon of vanilla extract. And again, the tip is to give it a good mix. Next, what you want to do is you want to fold in your flour mixture. There, so you want to make sure you've got in the sides a good figure of eight movement. And if you didn't know, eight comes between seven and nine. I'll give you that one for free. All this folding and mixing is good for the arm muscles. No need to go to the gym. That's one you can't because they're, they're not open. The next thing you need to do, which some banana breads do, some banana breads don't, is add some dark chocolate. So you get about 100 grams of dark chocolate. And the advice they give is... Pour them in. You're going to grab your spoon again. You're going to give it a good stir. One tip is to prevent um, any of the chocolate being on the bottom of the, of the cake, or particularly the sides. With my pre-lined tin, I have used some baking parchment as well as adding some butter to the mix just so it's a, just so it doesn't stick to the side what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stick it in the oven which is preheated for between 45 and 55 minutes and um, if you don't know when it's done stick a knife or um, a cocktail stick or even like any knitting needles in and if, and if it comes out it's a little bit wet you know that you, you, need, you need a bit more time than that Oh, Alexa, stop. The timer's just gone off and it's now time to get my cake out of the oven. So here we go. One glorious, and it does smell good, banana cake. I'm going to let it, I'm going to put it on a cooling rack. Um, I'm not going to try it now. I'm going to give it to someone. But um, thank you so much for watching Christchurch. I hope you enjoy the rest of the arts afternoon. And... If you would like the recipe for this banana bread, it is actually on the Lighthouse page on the Children's Church website. Or just email me. I'll send it to you. Thanks, guys. Hello, I'm Zippy and I'm going to be doing some lino cut printing today. Uh, so here in front of me, I've got a lino print that I've already carved. And um, this one was from Soft Cut Lino. So it's really bendy and quite easy to carve from. And then the finished product is something like this. Um, which is in reverse from the block uh, because when you roll it through the press you print it like that um, so I've also done in the past woodcut printing um, and this is just done from MDF um, a little bit harder to cut and then here I've got sort of traditional lino cut um, a lino block rather and um, on the back is sort of this hessian stuff and then this is actually quite hard to carve from you need to be quite firm with it um, and for that i use these tools um, so i've got different tools here one with a tiny u-shape uh, one with a really big u-shape and one with a v-shape and they all create different sorts of cuts um, and then you carve you end up with something like this. Um, so this is a really big one that I've done um, because I use this to make uh, lampshades from and you need a really long bit of fabric for a lampshade. Um, and this one was carved using this um, big U-shaped um, tool here. So when I finish, I create a lampshade a bit like this. Um, this is a different design from uh, the one I have in front of me. Uh, but this uh, lino has been used to make this fabric, which I've turned into a sponge bag. Um, this is another one again, um, meant to be a bit like a lily leaf. And so here's the lily leaf one again in grey. Here's the block here and another one of the same in orange. You can see that they're really long 
pieces of fabric that essentially make a lampshade when I've finished. So today I'm going to be printing on this block in front of me and then eventually I'll be making it into a lampshade when it's dry. So I'm ready to print now and um, I'm going to make an orange ink. I've got uh, some red and some yellow and I'm going to mix that 50% ink and 50% extender and uh, what the extender does is uh, make the ink more malleable, more easy to work. Also really important to add um, cobalt dryer. Cobalt dryer just dries your ink out and it means that you don't need to wait uh, weeks and weeks for it to dry. Your love is a flood and I swim deep when the tide is up. Sweet to the world, oh, and you taste sweet too. This is my deliverance, hands held high as you deliver it. Oh, you have made me a child of God, my feet on the ground, my heart in heaven. I am great, made without the living. Oh. So now my fabric is dry, it's ready to stick onto my sticky back plastic. And on the other side of the sticky back plastic is the same material as you get on the inside of a drum of a lampshade. Um, and what this does is it just peels back so you can stick the fabric straight onto it. And then you need to trim the edges and then you carefully roll it uh, with these rims um, so that it makes the top and the bottom edge of the lampshade. So what I also like to do is turn my designs into greetings cards. So here I've got the um, different designs in different colours um, and they're ready to go. Here I am using some hand printed fabric to reupholster an old chair. I hope you've enjoyed this arts afternoon and learned a bit more about lino cut printing. And here now is a slideshow of my lampshades and some cards. in my head oh as a gift from you your world floods my brain this gray cranium won't be the same well thank you for joining us at this arts afternoon if you'd like to know more about christianity or the lord jesus do go along to our church website uh, on there you can find my email address i'd love to hear from you and we can chat further well, our last contribution this afternoon is from Clara, who is uh, a teacher, but also a musician who writes her own songs and inspired by the events uh, of the last few months and the great and wonderful work our NHS has been doing. She has uh, written this song uh, for charity. We'll come to that in just a moment. So once again, I would just like to say thank you very much for spending time with us this afternoon. We sincerely hope that you've enjoyed looking at all the contributions from the people that have spent time putting together their videos, detailing so many different and wonderful hobbies. I must admit, I'm certainly keen to take up quilting, that's for sure. So we thank all of those people that have so willingly been part of this arts afternoon. And it only leaves for me to now say goodbye and enjoy the rest of your week. And a goodbye from me. Again, a huge thank you to all our contributors to this arts afternoon. Well, goodbye and God bless. For you.